morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this event, which has been organised by the EDGE Foundation. It's called Guaranteeing the Apprenticeship Guarantee. And we are going to have an hour of uh, debate on this. We're going to hear from Robert Halfen uh, very shortly as well. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Steph McGovern. I'm a broadcaster, financial journalist uh, for a long time on the BBC, uh, now jump ships to Channel 4. Uh, but the thing that's definitely got me where I am today is my vocational training, the apprenticeship I did with Black & Decker. I kind of credit it for the success I've had uh, throughout my career. So I'm really passionate about more people doing apprenticeships, about really making sure they're quality ones and that you know we give young people and in fact all people throughout their career a choice over how they learn and uh, what they do. And so it's my pleasure to host this today from my living room, uh, but this is the weird world we're in now, isn't it? Uh, wherever you are uh, sitting at the moment, whether it's your kitchen or your bedroom or wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us. But I think, all of everything that's happened uh, over the last few months has, has really made us question so many things, hasn't it, that we'd taken for granted, uh, things like jobs, the economy, the economy growing, you know, so many elements of our life that we've relied on. We're having to rethink about now. And, and one area, obviously, of concern is if there's a pressure on the economy, what is that going to mean uh, for jobs and what's that going to mean for apprenticeships? Because, you know, as a financial journalist and covering things like the credit crunch, I've seen it when times are tough. It's often things like apprenticeships that get squeezed. So uh, today it's talking about how, how we make sure we don't let that happen, how we still give people People the choice and opportunity uh, to train on the job and do the fantastic apprenticeships that are out there and a, a very important advocate of apprenticeships as you will know is the chair of the education select committee and conservative MP Robert Halfen uh, who has and I've had many conversations with him about this um, over the years been really championing uh, apprenticeships and so he is obviously part uh, of the government have announced this idea of an apprenticeship guarantee. So let's find out what all of that is about. So uh, Robert's going to tell us, he's going to do a speech for us in a more, then we'll have a discussion uh, after that with some panellists all involved in the sector, bringing lots of different angles to this from industry, from education, from the Edge Foundation. Uh, and there'll be a chance as well for us to get your questions too. Thank you so to the people who've already sent the questions in. I've got them, I've been called Incorporated them into the, the things I'm going to ask as well, but do keep sending them in. There's a, a way of doing that online where you can get them to us in the chat bit of the, uh, of, the of this Zoom setup, and you'll be able to send them in. Uh, also, there's a hashtag if you want to tweet while we're, we're chatting. That's hashtag Edge Debate. And again, of course, this is a good way of keeping things uh, going and uh, talked about for those who can't be on this session as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Robert Halfen MP, who's going to kick things off for us. Morning, Robert. Uh, good morning, Steph. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's an honour for you to introduce me because I think probably one of the few broadcasters I've ever seen who constantly talks about apprenticeships and vocational education on uh, uh, television and so it's uh, wonderful to have you and can I also thank um, Alice Barnard and Ollie Newton from EDGE. EDGE is an extraordinary charity that does so much to promote skills uh, across the United Kingdom and vocational education and practices what it preaches. It isn't just a think tank, it actually uh, opens schools like the EDGE school uh, in Essex which I've been to and I'll mention in my speech. I'm passionate about apprenticeships. I uh, first came to, I knew what an apprentice was, but I hadn't really thought about it. It was just before, uh, a couple of years before I got elected in 2010. I was a parliamentary candidate and I went to a really uh, grotty building in my constituency in Harlow and met some uh, young people who were with look, being looked after by a charity called Catch 22. And a lot of them at that meeting said they were passionate about doing an apprenticeship. They wanted to transform their lives and yet they couldn't do it because there weren't enough. They didn't understand it. If they were offered an interview, one of them said I had to travel to Leeds, which would be impossible from Essex for a young uh, guy from a disadvantaged background. And I walked out of that meeting thinking that this was my Eureka moment. And if I got elected, I would champion apprenticeships and skills because I always believed that it was a ladder of opportunity for 
our young people and it really uh, is and this is why I talk about it again and again in Parliament it was my first ever speech and I've employed six apprentices in my parliamentary office something that had never happened before before I started it off in 2010. Now it's not often in life that one of our wishes is granted at the start of last month, colleagues at Edge Foundation kicked off a campaign asking people what their one wish would be for the future of education. When they asked me that question, my answer was very simple. And I said, I'd like to guarantee every young person an apprenticeship that can see them progress all the way from level two to level seven and see 50% of students doing a degree apprenticeships. Following his appearance at the Liaison Committee, which is a parliamentary, a big parliamentary committee for all the committee chairs in, in the House of Commons, I was really pleased that the Prime Minister expressed his support for just such an apprenticeship guarantee. And today I want to tackle these three questions. What is an apprenticeship guarantee? Why an apprenticeship guarantee? How do we guarantee that apprenticeship guarantee? So let me start with the question of what we mean by an apprenticeship guarantee. There are several possible answers and opinions that have been raised in the education press following the Prime Minister's comments. It could mean guaranteeing funding for any employers who want to offer an apprenticeship. It could mean guaranteeing young people an apprenticeship if there is one available. But what I'd like to see is something much more ambitious a recasting of our skills priorities to place apprenticeships front and centre, to create a new apprenticeship culture as the lifeblood of training and employment. Now, I know this will not be possible from day one, but I want us to work towards being able to guarantee that any young person who wants one and who has the right starting skills and qualifications can start an apprenticeship. That would truly be an apprenticeship guarantee. Turning to the question of why an apprenticeship guarantee, what is special about apprenticeships? As any of you who've heard me speak before will know, I make no attempt to hide the fact that I'm a big fan, and you know that from my introduction. Apprenticeships combine a real job with training so that people can earn while they learn. They offer opportunities in a huge range of sectors not just the important traditional heartlands of engineering and manufacturing, but finance, software, design, the green economy. And they've got remarkable returns for all those involved. Apprentices go on to have excellent employment prospects, business benefit from new expertise, and the wider economy receives £28 of benefit from every £1 invested in a level three apprenticeship. But it will be no mean feat. Before the pandemic, the number of apprenticeship starts in the first half of the last academic year dropped 15% for those aged 16 to 19. And according to the Social Mobility Commission's latest report, there was a much greater decline in starts for apprentices from disadvantaged backgrounds between 2015-16 and 2017-18, 36% compared with their better off peers. The economy has been changing for a long time as the fourth industrial revolution hits. As Edge, Edge's skill shortage bulletins show, millions of jobs in our economy were already being out impacted by automation, AI and robotics before we had even heard the word corona. And despite this, the government's unpre unprecedented financial contribution to soften the blow the economic impact of this pandemic will be very severe. The strongest of those impacts are being felt and will continue to be felt by younger people and by most disadvantaged families. Analysis by the Institute for Fiscal Studies highlighted in Edge's report last week shows that those with the lowest earnings were about seven times more likely to work down in a shutdown sector as those with the highest earnings. Meanwhile, a report by the Resolution Foundation showed that by May, those aged 18 to 24 were by far the most affected age group. Almost a quarter of young employees had been furloughed and a further 11% had either lost their jobs or lost hours and pay because of the coronavirus. 
things have been particularly difficult for apprentices. The Sutton Trust has shown that over a third have been furloughed and one in 10 have been made redundant. So we face a very challenging starting point. But I remain convinced that a radical expansion of the programme to create a real culture of apprenticeships here, similar to continental countries like Germany, Switzerland and Austria, would be best for young people and best for our economy. So how should we go about guaranteeing an apprenticeship guarantee? A quick word first about how we shouldn't. We can't go back to the youth training scheme of the 1980s or to program led apprenticeships and relabel things that aren't real apprenticeships. We also shouldn't prioritize new apprentices at the expense of existing apprentices. Indeed, they should be prioritized to continue and complete their training. Now, I don't have a team of civil servants and statisticians modeling the numbers but I do have six concrete proposals that would help deliver a massive increase in the number of apprenticeships for young people. First, I firmly believe that the apprenticeship levy has been a positive move for the system, bringing us closer to the ambitious aim of emulating Germany and Switzerland's apprenticeship culture. But long before COVID hit, there were already concerns that this was funding middle management apprenticeships at the expense of kick-starting young people's careers. Now is the time to change that definitively, to refocus the levy pot so that it can be used primarily on apprenticeships for 16 to 24 year olds and to tackle disadvantage. One option, for example, would be to allow an employer to fully fund the training of a younger apprentice or an individual from a more disadvantaged background from the levy, but only partially fund an older apprentice. Second, we must look to the public sector to lead the way, with a massive increase in jobs and apprenticeship opportunities. This will build on the legacy of the amazing work done by apprentices in the NHS and across the frontline services during the pandemic. This should be delivered through a much higher target for public bodies, greater accountability and procurement. So for example, if the public sector were to hire 50,000 new members of staff a year and the target was increased by five percentage points each year, we would end up with almost 4,000 new apprenticeships in 2021 and over 11,000 a year by 2024. However, the public sector is not even meeting its existing target of 2.3%, so we need a greater level of drive and accountability in the system. Where possible, we should work to ensure that all new public sector recruits are apprentices, and we must hold public sector bodies accountable, be that to my education select committee or another forum. On public procurement, as we build back better and renew our infrastructure, there should be a much greater expectation for the number of apprentices hired in the supply chain. That should be a key consideration for all public sector procurement going forward. Third, there is no doubt that the Chancellor's brave decision to introduce the furlough scheme has been vital in protecting businesses, particularly smaller businesses during the lockdown. As we emerge from that period and look to build back better, we now need to bring those small enterprises and third sector organisations together with the extraordinary talent of our young people to develop new opportunities for growth. As the furlough scheme winds down, the three billion National Skills Fund could be used towards covering training costs and the first year salary costs for small and medium businesses taking on young apprentices or used for a, sub a wage subsidy in another way. There are a variety of views from providers and employers on the level of this subsidy, between 50 and 100% of the wages of the apprentice in their first year. I would start possibly with half the cost, which the Association of Colleges has estimated at £3,000 per apprentice at a total cost of £1 billion. This could then be topped up by local or regional approaches or increased if more places are needed. Supporting innovation and growth, supporting young people's development, it's a win-win. Fourth, we can also support smaller businesses 
by sweeping away any remaining bureaucracy that surrounds the apprenticeship program. This makes it harder for busy small businesses and third sector organisations at the forefront of our recovery to engage. The department should look again at rules like 20% off the job training, perhaps rel relaxing, front loading or funding that time. I will come on to degree apprenticeships in my next point, but our education committee's report into nursing degree apprenticeships unearthed the maze of bureaucracy which the NHS must navigate as well as the onerous 50% of the off-the-job training requirements set by the Nursing and Midwifery Council, NHS employers must grapple, grapple with regulation and paperwork from 10 plus different bodies. By tearing down some of the barriers, we could create far more nursing degree apprenticeships. The government could also look to international examples to support an extension of models like the apprenticeship training agencies or shared apprenticeship schemes that can dramatically reduce the risk and bureaucracy for small organisations. Take the example of Australia. Around 12% of apprenticeships are brokered through apprenticeship training agencies, in increasing to more than 50% for certain sectors like plumbing. The government incentivises the recruitment of apprentices from indigen indigenous populations, giving them a pathway to skilled work, as well as in sectors that meet regional skills needs and targets incentives towards new apprenticeship starts to avoid gaming of the system. Predominantly social enterprises, the Apprentice Training uh, Associations act, uh, agencies act as specialists in managing paperwork and recruitment. Crucially, they bear the risk if the business needs to downsize and support the apprentice into another placement to complete their training. Fifth, now to my two favourite words in the English language, degree apprenticeships. I know there are tough times ahead for universities as for all other business and education institutions, but now is the time, there's no better time in fact, to embrace a change that has been needed for some time. As long-standing examples of practically focused degree courses like the Edge Hotel School at the University of Essex, a place that I have been to and it's quite extraordinary alongside Cardiff's University National Software Academy, they show the best graduates for industry are those who've learned the theory and had the opportunity to practice, knowledge and skills hand in hand. We should restart the Degree Apprenticeship Development Fund to help broker degree apprenticeships between universities and businesses. We should reform the levy so that much more can be used for degree apprenticeships that meet the skills needs of the nation. We need wage subsidies for employers taking on degree apprentices. And the 800 million universities spend on access and participation alongside the Office for Students should be redirected towards those universities growing their degree apprentice student numbers. Over the next decade, universities should work towards a target of 50% of their students undertaking degree level apprenticeships. Reaching the 50% target may seem unlikely, but if the recent upward trend in degree level apprenticeships continues at the same rate, and alongside some serious policy encouragement, it could take 10 years for half of all university students to be doing these courses. Sixth, the whole area of overseas aid has been in the headlines recently. The now former Department for International Development currently funds the International Citizenship Service, a volunteering body for 18 to 25 year olds in international development projects that has already worked with 80,000 volunteers abroad. Why not use a significant chunk of aid money to transform the existing ICS into an apprenticeship service overseas, ASO? These apprentices working with civil society and businesses would help the developing world and develop their skills at the same time, earning an apprenticeship standard in overseas aid. At the same time, supported by the subsidy I've already mentioned, local voluntary sector organisations should be supported to hire apprentices to embed the community spirit that we've seen growing during the lockdown. Finally, 
We can have all the policies in the world, but none of this will make a huge difference unless we get young people to take up the offer. And that starts with a radical change of careers advice in this country. We need proper targets for schools in terms of encouraging their pupils to go out onto apprenticeships, proper enforcement of the Baker Clause, proper engagement from Ofsted on this issue, a proper UCAS style system for FE skills and apprenticeships, proper destination data that puts getting an apprenticeship on a par with going to university and a proper national skills service, a one-stop shop for careers advice and work experience, putting an end to the duplication of national careers organisations and giving every, quick, every young person a quick and easy route into an apprenticeship. I'm probably running out of wishes around now, so I will wrap up as I want plenty of time to discuss this with the panel. Just to summarise, I want us to develop a true guarantee of an apprenticeship for any suitably young, qualified young person who wants one. I want that because apprenticeships are hugely positive returns for individual businesses and the wider economy. I recognise that we start from a challenging place, reducing numbers of young apprenticeships, the fourth industrial revolution and the impact of COVID-19. We certainly don't want to recreate the mistakes of the past, like relabeling provision as apprenticeships, and we don't want to prioritise new apprenticeships at the expense of existing apprentices. But we can take action now to deliver a massive increase in opportunities for young people. By rebalancing the levy, by asking more of the public sector, by providing financial support to small businesses and organisations, by cutting red tape, by radically expanding degree apprenticeships, and by putting apprenticeships at the centre of our overseas aid effort. There will of course be people who say it will be impossible to give an apprenticeship guarantee to every young person, and you will find a number of computers that say no. But given what has happened with the coronavirus the pandemic and the huge skills needs facing our nation, we have to be mindful of the words of Sir Nicholas Winton. If it's not impossible, there must be a way to do it. With evangelization from the Prime Minister and those leading in politics in the community, with detailed policy work through by the government, think tanks, pressure groups, my committee, we must be able to come up with really exciting apprenticeship offerings for young people. After all, it was not so long ago that Tony Blair, who talked about university, 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 he achieved the target of 50% of students going to university because there was the political will to do, to do this behind it. Surely the same can be the case if we have a real will for apprenticeships with our battle cry, skills, skills, skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Appreciate that. And uh, just fantastic to hear about that vision. I know we've already had lots of questions uh, from everybody watching. Uh, if you're wondering how to ask a question, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, you, if you click on that, you can type a message in there. Uh, we're getting those straight through to us. So thank you to everyone who's sent them in. Just a reminder as well, if you want to tweet about it, it's hashtag edge debate. So loads uh, to talk about from Robert's speech there and uh, I'm going to introduce our panellists now who you've just seen pop up on the screen. Uh, from the EDGE Foundation we've got Alice Barnard who's a Chief Executive and Ollie Newton who's Executive Director. From industry you can see that Andrew Churchill who's Executive Chair Chairman of JJ Churchill Limited. This is a family-owned aerospace precision engineering business which is based in the Midlands. Uh, from education we've got Sally Dickett who's Chief Executive Officer of Active Learning which brings together in one group and and this is incredible, this is all in one group, three FE colleges, three UTCs, two 18, 11 to 18 uh, secondary schools, a studio school, a training provider delivering apprenticeships, training and consulting in the workplace, and a specialist engineering training provider. So covering lots of different elements uh, uh, there on this. So what I want to do first of all is just get a quick chat, guys, on your thoughts on what uh, Robert said there as part of his vision. Alice, do you want to, do you want to start us off on that? Uh, thank you very much, Steph. Uh, that was a really, really interesting speech, Rob. Thank you so much. There's a lot of detail in there, and I think we'll get a, a lot of very uh, uh, interesting questions off the back of that. I think one of my reflections from what you said is that the importance of maintaining existing apprentices. 
Uh, I know certainly a lot of young people and uh, those that employ apprentices uh, are worried that firstly a lot of them are on furlough at the moment and secondly there is a danger that some of those will be made redundant or indeed have been made redundant. And I think it's really important, as you said in your speech, that we ensure that this uh, apprenticeship guarantee isn't something for brand new customers only, uh, and that we do everything we can to maintain those young people already on the job and already in training, because it would be heartbreaking to see young people uh, losing that uh, opportunity partway through their training. Uh, and the, the idea of young people having to try and think about how they complete their training elsewhere when the economy is uh, suffering uh, deeply uh, from the coronavirus would be very worrying indeed. Yeah, and, and we'll put that, Robert, we'll, I'll come to you shortly on that. I'll just collect a few more thoughts and then put this uh, all to you. Um, Andrew, do you want to give me your thoughts on this as, as someone in industry who's employing apprentices, who, you know, is part of uh, the community? What are your thoughts? Well, our business is 82 years young and we've had apprentices right from the beginning. My grandfather, who founded our business back in 1937, was himself an apprentice and unusually he'd done a degree first and then did an apprenticeship which a was very odd in those days but b has a certain uh, echo of today's degree apprenticeships and our business yeah. values above all else makers we're about making things and actually the uk is brilliant at this and we should be enormously proud of it and this isn't to disparage degrees in any way but we need makers as well as thinkers and those two uniquely go hand in hand through the apprenticeship model up to degree apprenticeship. So if I look across my board, all of my heads of departments, they're all ex-apprentices. Now, many have gone on and got degrees and higher, higher degrees, but they are ex-apprentices. And we as a nation need to be proud of our apprenticeships. And I think one of the things that we're going to have to chip away at, and Robert, a lot of your comments are going to lead towards this, is this parity of esteem between those who have taken a vocational route and those who have gone down a more conventional academic one. And this, this thinker versus doer paradigm is, is completely artificial. We all learn in different ways. And having the opportunity for vocational training is a fantastic ladder out of disadvantage for some. So one of the things I really picked up towards the end of your comments, I think it was item six, was joining up with schools, making sure our, our youngsters have the oppor opportunity at school to have a taste of what actually vocational learning might be about. If we just focus on the academic, not only will some fail at the academic side because they don't understand how it links into and relates to the world of work, but actually will leave behind a huge part of society. Really exciting points, Robert. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. And again, I'll, I'll collate this and, and put this to you shortly, Robert. But um, Sally, uh, from your perspective, if someone who's constantly you know, talking to learners and talking to industry, what did you think about this idea? Um, Robert, I think there's some really exciting things in there that do excite me, not least the small businesses bureaucracy, because lots, most of our businesses are SMEs and that's their big, oh, but there, there are two issues and I'm, I'm going to pick up from Andrew. One is actually at seven further educations and seven schools and we run apprenticeships in our schools. The issue for lots of parents is where will it take me? And I think if we can encourage business to take somebody at a two and a three and absolutely do a degree apprentice, but work through with that young person. I know BMW, because we work with them, does that. So you can go in at level two and you can leave with an Oxford Brooks University degree at the end. So I think when we're talking about universities doing degree apprenticeships, rather than get everybody to go to university, some of those degree apprenticeships, we must encourage business to see it through, to give, to give it that status, because parents will see it. My child can start at 16 and get a degree. Fantastic, I'll look at apprenticeships. The second issue is about confidence in business. Um, I think we, we're talking about money and I would never 100% subsidise anybody's wage. I think businesses have to give something. So I give a hefty subsidy, but actually we both have to give in this. And if you're not prepared to give at least 30%, then you're not serious. Um, <clears throat> but I do think we, we, we need to um, give back confidence to business because they won't recruit. And if you look, many businesses have got pretty good balance sheets they're just not recruiting um, so business confidence parent confidence young people confidence um, and I I really like the idea of some flexibility in the levy 
and um, off the job training because certainly that is what business is looking for. My only thing that you haven't talked about is we have lots of young people that are academically able but have no emotional resilience. And often the socially, people with lacking social mobility, everybody thinks they're not up to it. They're absolutely up to it. They don't have social and emotional resilience. So I think we shouldn't ignore traineeships to get those young people, particularly who've been out for five months, back on the ladder so they can actually go and get that guarantee you're talking about. And if we had that as well, you, you've absolutely excited me. Hmm. Oh, thank you very much for that, Sally. Um, I'll come to you in a bit, Ollie, but just picking up, Robert, then, on what's been talked about there, because I know just looking at the chat coming in and the questions, that that issue of parity of esteem and, you know, giving people the confidence that they will do just as well as somebody who's done just a purely academic route is something that comes up again and again and again. It's why I battle so much to get things on the news about apprenticeships because most of the people in my industry have got the same background which is degree uh, just pure straight academic route um so what what do you think is going to change about that what in this because one of the things that i picked up on was the um this idea of, of targets in schools so does that mean are we going to see it as part of ofsted are they going to be judging schools on how uh, they encourage apprenticeships as well because I know that one of the big things is that lots of schools are focused solely on the academics because that's exactly what they get judged on by Ofsted so there might be a teacher who's very into apprenticeships but if they're not getting judged on that when Ofsted come in why would they bother so you know what what do you mean by targets in schools yeah so can I just, uh, first, can I just deal with the traineeships? Uh, you're yeah. absolutely right about that. And I saw when I was a minister for skills, I saw amazing traineeship, uh, traineeship projects that helped in unbelievably disadvantaged uh, kids who then uh, the results were, it was run by the Princess Trust. I went to a project in South London and the results of the kids from who had been, some of them had been inside uh, youth offending centres or whatever, they, they had got a huge amount to do apprenticeships and stay on the course. So, and uh, I think there is a special 100 million fund for apprenticeships announced by the previous chancellor um, to, but one, uh, Philip Hammond about traineeships. So you're absolutely right. I want to bring them to be used as a bridge for apprenticeships. In terms of Alice, uh, you're completely right too. We've got to make sure that existing apprentices are looked after and can carry through with their training and are encouraged to progress because so often I meet apprentices who may be doing a level two or even a level three and then no one has even talked to them about doing a level four or level five so we've got to talk about uh, progression. Um, in terms of Andrew Churchill and this comes to uh, Steph's point about parity of esteem I, I believe that we're moving into a world where there shouldn't be a divide between academic and vocational courses. I think this is the big mistake. And I actually think, supposing you do history, why on earth don't you also spend your time also uh, in the British Museum, for example, or as an archaeologist? Or there may be another option. There are some schools that take children to battlefields while they're learning. Um, so I think all um, courses, this shouldn't be either academic or vocational. I think all academic studies should be academic and vocational. It's not an either or. And I think the divide that we're, we make is, is often a, you may want to specialise, absolutely, but it should not be an either or. And the only thing will change, and this is where parents and so on come in, we have to change uh, careers. Schools don't do it for a number of reasons. One, Ofsted, Ofsted needs to be much tougher on it but all teachers have to do degrees why can't we have teaching undergraduate apprenticeships we have teacher postgraduate apprenticeships but not teaching undergraduate apprenticeships um why um if we had a ucas for fe skills and apprenticeships we would have schools wanting to and they were done at the same time as ucas for universities um what you'd have schools promoting apprenticeships so there's a mixture of carrot as well as stick it isn't just about stick and it isn't always uh, the school's fault because everything has been about university 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 from the government which as i said at the end of my speech should be about skills 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 and as i say if you go uh, to i mean we, we had a student we've had apprentices in our office we've had a student 
the student was doing politics at university, but he had to work a year in, um, in, in a parliamentary office as part of his degree. And that should be the, the, the norm for, I think, for e almost every course um, that they should do uh, practical on the job uh, training. And I th especially with the world we're about to join in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so one of the things that's coming up quite a lot, just noticing this from the chat and the, the questions and answers is about, and you, you talked about um, helping the disadvantaged uh, young people. And a couple of comments made by uh, people like Lisa saying, um, she's asking about benefits saying that she comes across quite a lot of young people who are not taking on apprenticeships because it means that it affects the benefits of the family and actually the family would be better off with them being at college rather than apprenticeships uh, and also just issues around transport as well like it's all very well saying you know someone doing history can then go and you know work in the museum but how do they get there you know if they haven't got the money to pay for the transport so what are you doing around that around yeah. the impact on benefits and them so, actually being able to afford to do these to get so these? The, um a couple of things so the benefits thing is a very complicated one and i accept that and there isn't an easy answer to this because let's say for example if child benefit which was an issue that came up when again when i was a minister it does cost hundreds of millions of pounds so you have to make that case to uh, the treasury what i do would like to see is much higher apprenticeship wages um because obviously um it is the the, for the starting apprenticeship wage um is is quite small i definitely think that there should be transport help um because this particularly hits apprentices in rural areas for example or would be apprentices because they can't afford the travel i've campaigned on the the transport subsidy for quite a time but what you've also got to remember to be fair to the government is the apprentice i want the apprentice wage to be higher but they are earning whereas if they're a student they're not earning anything in fact they're taking on a loan to, and they get very little they get a maintenance grant a maintenance loan but they get very little subsidy so there might be the odd bursary at the university but it's very small so what i would like to see is help with the transport and higher wages and uh, um, also perhaps cutting their taxes that they pay which the government are doing in terms of uh, raising the threshold in which lower earners are taxed but the benefit thing is not going to be an easy answer because it will cost hundreds of millions of pounds yeah sally i imagine this is something you have quite a lot to say on yeah, I mean, I, I, there is no doubt, and e even if you're in Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Surrey, which is where we operate, transport costs are a big issue for young people. Um, and therefore, if there was support again, I think it would be helpful because um, people will be able to actually get there and feel confident. Um, so I think that would be fantastic. I think wages need to be looked at, but you've got this constant conflict between, well, if I'm going to take on a 16 year old and they're going to cost me X, I might as well take on somebody older. The other thing, again, um, which I think we need to look at for businesses is if they're not used to taking 16 year olds on, is who is actually looking after those young people when they're in the business. Because when you're between 16 and 20, you'll look at all of us and think, I mean, certainly me, you know, those people are pretty crusty to me. They're not my type of person. So how are we enabling them to understand what it's like working? You know, when you're 16, somebody of 32 seems pretty ancient. And if I look around, again, a lot of public sector organisations, which we're sort of, you know, there's a lot of older people in them. So it's also creating the environment to enable a 16 to 18 year old to thrive. It's not just about wages and transport. It's about the environment you create. And is there somebody in the organisation? And this is really hard for SMEs, which is why I think providers need to help more, is who am I providing to actually understand the needs of a young person? Yeah. Andrew, in, in your business, what do you do to make sure that when young people start, they they feel like they, they're part of the family and they're not too dissimilar? And also, I noticed quite a few people on the chat are saying things like they've had young people ask them questions that like, I don't even know what to wear to go to work. And, and it's true. So who, who's, who should so be doing that? And the what first do you thing guys do? Start, it starts, Steph, with getting school school teachers and school pupils in to visit before they're even considering an apprenticeship. 
having our businesses open for visits is critical. We can't criticise our teachers, our parents, our students for not understanding what we do if we don't open ourselves up. So having open days, having uh, class visits with a chance in a very safe way to walk around and understand what we make is essential. So that they do come in having a, a faint understanding of what you make. The next thing is, um, apprenticeship will often involve in our business um, a taste for three months in, in one area before moving to another. Whilst they're working in each of those areas, they'll be working with the team leader in that area. And, th and that's very much a functional lead, but they also have for their whole time as an apprentice, a mentor. And that's a senior ex-apprentice, somebody who isn't too many years older, who can relate to them. I mean, I'm sure to a 16 year or 17 year old, they still look a lot older, but they, they speak the same vernacular. And that's somebody they can go to and, and ask that silly question, because those silly questions are rarely silly. They're, they're ones that actually are probably going to make quite a difference to their career going forward. So I think that's really important. And the third thing I'd say is make sure as a small business, because we're a small employer, make sure that you're working very closely with your college. Your college can provide a huge amount of advice in this area. And that monthly touch point through the second and the third years is invaluable. Yeah. Um, Ollie, let me bring you in here because I know you, you've done work extensively looking at this uh, internationally as well. And, and we heard Rob mention there about um, Germany and Switzerland. So how, how do you think these ideas compare to, to what's happening in other countries where it is? Yeah, th thank you so much, Steph and Robert. Um, so I think there's a lot of lessons internationally and a lot of lessons from history as well. Um, Liz was just saying on the chat just now uh, the importance of looking back. So just a word on, on both of those areas. Um, in terms of history, I think uh, there's, there's a rich history of, of this kind of scheme uh, in the UK, things like the Youth Opportunities Programme, Youth Training Scheme in the 80s, Programme Lad Apprenticeships uh, in the early 2000s. Um, a, a lot's been kind of mentioned about those in the education press in relation to this guarantee. Um, I think it's important to remember that they were not all bad. There are some lessons there uh, in terms of being particularly linked to infrastructure projects. Um, uh, for instance, the building of Edinburgh Zoo, I think, was, was done partly by the Youth Training Scheme. But I think the two key lessons from them um, are around, you know, not promising something that can't be delivered. So uh, particularly with programme-led apprenticeships, uh, young people uh, were on those schemes, kind of promised a real job at the end, but they didn't often, often didn't come off. So there's kind of a, a need to be upfront with young people. Um, and also has come, has come up already some challenges with the kind of level of pay and support for those apprentices. And obviously that's come up in the question about benefits. Um, internationally, uh, we've been looking at kind of comparators. Austria has a, a training guarantee. Um, so an interesting kind of comparator there. They obviously have a, a kind of richer and deeper heritage of apprenticeships, as Robert was saying, uh, similar to Switzerland and Germany. Um, one of the interesting things there is that the public sector is the kind of lender of last resort if somebody can't get an apprenticeship. So that links to Robert's point about the public sector, um, but also a really strong role for colleges and training providers to prepare young people there for apprenticeships. Um, so a real kind of boon and push for that traineeships point that we heard about. Yeah, and just picking up on you mentioned public sector there a couple of times. Again, that's something that's coming up a lot about uh, Robert. How do you make sure that the public sector is delivering enough apprenticeships here? Because lots of people say that's where they're having problems. You know, they're working on projects where um, perhaps there isn't an apprenticeship scheme as part of their offering. So, what are you doing on that side of things? Well, um, the, I mentioned the public sector hasn't met its existing target, so just over two percent. And public sector should lead by example. Um, it is difficult. There are cobwebs of bureaucracy that need to be swept away. And I highlighted some of them just in terms of a nursing uh, degree apprenticeship. But I think that um, there should be somebody in the cabinet office, a senior um, civil servant direct to Michael Gove, that is responsible for rapidly boosting the public sector apprenticeship uh, programme. And that every new recruit to the public sector uh, where it is possible, it may not be possible all the time, uh, there should be a condition that if it is possible, they should be uh, given the chance to do an, an apprenticeship. And then the public sector bodies need to be accountable, much more accountable than they are to Parliament, um, to co uh, committees in Parliament, the different committees that they're responsible for, to report every, uh, maybe twice a year on how they are improving the number of apprenticeships in their organization but on the other side as i say it's vital that the bureaucracy whether it's the esfa the institute for apprenticeship and technical education those cobwebs of bureaucracy are swept away and it's made easier for them but they have to set an example 
um, and we should be trying to encourage apprenticeships in every walk of the public sector. And as I mentioned, public sector procurement, if companies want to procure government contracts, they should have significant proportion of their employees as apprenticeships. It should be a requirement. Why are they so rubbish at it? <laughs> well, it's fairly new. It only came in when I was, uh, again, in my previous role in government. And uh, I don't know the answer why it is taking such a long time. I think the bureaucracy has got to, something to do with it. But I also think there isn't someone from the top of government who's head of the civil service who's pushing this, talking about it every day. But it's got to change. There needs to be radical change in, the, in terms of the way the public sector see apprenticeships. They should be first and foremost a priority. And we, we clearly see, Robert, that you are such an advocate for it. You're, you know, you're constantly banging the drum of it as, as chair of the Education Select Committee as well. But you, you mentioned there about we need a certain senior civil uh, you know, service leaders to be on board with this. Is there a problem in politics as well, like there is in the media, where it's that it is a snobbery? There's a, a sense of, oh, it's not that important. We'll say a few things about it in a couple of speeches, throw them a bit of money. But there's not really people who get it, are there, in politics? Yeah. I, think that, I think that it is, there is a lot of snobbery, but there's also just a lack of understanding. I mean, I, I, I went to a university. Um, so I, um, I came to this from the story that I told you, meeting those young kids from Catch-22 in 28, 29, but also I came to it because visiting my Carlo College, which I've visited over 70 times since 2010, since being a member of parliament. And that changed my life as well, because uh, it is a, such a brilliant college. And I'm not just proud of it because it's in my constituency, but you see how it, a, a further education college is a, 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 a community hub, a center for addressing social injustice, a center for meeting our skills needs. And uh, I realised that this was the answer to so many of our problems, apprenticeships and skills. And uh, I think that actually the problem is because every MP has been to university, not all of them have been to FE colleges. I think um, we're very lucky that we've got a very good skills minister. She did a degree apprenticeship. She started off doing skills. She really knows uh, she's cut the mustard, so to speak. She knows what she's doing. She's very impressive, Gillian Keegan. And also, uh, Gavin Williamson is one of the few cabinet ministers, if possibly the only one, because I think it was previously Gavin Williamson and Sajid Javid who'd been to an FE college. So it lived, and it was no accident that under Sajid, the FE sector got more money mm. because he understood it. Yeah. Um, Alice, can I ask you a bit about uh, this idea of, of bringing in apprenticeships at a younger age? So there's a couple of people, including Anne on here, who mentions that she works in an area of high deprivation with many vulnerable youngsters um, living in generational uh, poverty. And she's saying, you know, why do we make them do very middle class uh, GCSE system, French history? Why can't they start doing part time apprenticeships, maybe one or two days a week at school uh, and gradually transfer to a full-time one once they uh, get it in an acceptable level like couldn't we be doing it earlier on in, in the system Alice what are your thoughts on that? I think that's an incredibly important point actually and I've seen as the as we've been talking the chat and the Q&A is talking about this a lot firstly uh, good career advice and guidance is absolutely critical in schools if we want to change the system then we need to inform young people parents and teachers what the opportunities are and then how to find pathways to those opportunities um, and currently, our curriculum is incredibly knowledge based. It is uh, very narrow. Uh, it still focuses on a curriculum that was designed for the Victorian age. And here we are in the 21st century uh, in a global economy that is uh, digitally based, which is completely connected. Um, and our curriculum just doesn't match this new challenge. And while ever the government continues to bang the drum for the EBAC, continues to push young people, as you said, down a heavily knowledge-based curriculum that is uh, focused on young people amassing knowledge simply to regurgitate it in tests, then we are not allowing uh, the environment, the conditions for those young people to progress into apprenticeships. So we're almost um, creating failure before it started, which is unfair on young people, it's unfair on schools, it's unfair on employers, but it's also unfair on the economy because these are the young people who could develop the skills, the wherewithal, the knowledge, the abilities to be uh, the catalyst for economic recovery. 
and yet we're crushing it in schools. And unless we address that issue now, we won't be able to see the brilliant um, words of Rob come to light because we'll simply be squashing the pipeline before it even starts. Yeah, Ollie, you want to pick up on that as well? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of great models that we can kind of learn from there. One is just north of the border in Scotland where, where foundation apprenticeships exist, which do broadly exactly what you're suggesting, Steph. The idea is that you can take one alongside your studies while you're at school, keep all your doors open. If you did one in, say, engineering, you could use that to go on to university, but it also gives you up to nine months off the start of your apprenticeship if you want to go on to one. So it's like a no wrong door approach that we could um, easily adopt across the border. Um, we also had young apprenticeships for 14 to 16 year olds here in England. Uh, it only got canned because the Treasury felt that it was too expensive. And actually, lots of the evaluation suggested that it was really powerful. And we've got colleagues on the call from organizations like Education Business Partnerships that, that ran those programs. So there's a lot of expertise in the system to, to kind of get that back up and running if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, Rob, is it possible? Is this something that, you know, we, we could look into as well, the, the idea of starting things earlier on? Well, I would love that. And I, I actually think that as much as possible, um, that a lot of schooling, there should be um, work experience and that um, the way, for example, kids get to learn about your, as Andrew said, is by actually visiting the companies and spending time with them. So they know they get some familiarity um, in terms of what they like. I mean, and too often careers events in schools are just uh, once or twice a year where you get a woman dressed as a nurse and a man dressed as an engineer and completely so that and when then you ask yourself why don't you have enough women doing stem subjects for for example um so i i would absolutely favor that and i saw something on the chat i think it was from uh, lauren from the association of colleges that in australia they do have kind of pre-apprenticeship programs in schools and and send their kids out on a regular basis and um this is this is this is why we do need radical change and in terms of the EBAC that Alice was talking about. Too often we've had a argument in our country between progressives and traditionalists or knowledge and skills and actually you need a blend of both. Um, I like my whiskey blended and I also think learning should be uh, blended and um, I would like if we're going to still have the EBAC why on earth isn't design and technology in it? Why on earth aren't we doing everything possible to encourage uh, quality not mush, quality state-of-the-art design and technology and, and trying to get as many young people as possible uh, learning these incredibly important subjects that are going to be absolutely relevant for the age that we are about to enter because the fourth industrial revolution will change every aspect of our lives and just to give one example everyone thinks it's just about manual labor but the uh, I went to a bank, a, seed, a big bank in the city of London. They had got rid of all their accountants because they were uh, being done by artificial intelligence. But having said that, they retrained them all to become cybersecurity experts. So it is possible to reskill, and it's not all doom and gloom. But we have to reskill and look at our curriculum and have as much vocational curriculum that is that is of high standard and high quality, um, and not and get out of this stale argument of knowledge or skills or progressive or traditionalists yeah it comes back to what andrew was saying earlier about it, you know it doesn't have to we don't have to compartmentalize everyone do we let's just appreciate people learn in different ways but that doesn't mean that because they learn a certain way they can't do a certain thing but you know um can i ask about t levels and where they sit in all of this well t levels are important and they will improve the prestige of uh of our education system in terms of technical education they'll be offered to uh, post 16 and they will have an element of uh, work experience uh, uh to them they have yet to be rolled out the coming coming soon in stages so i hope that it uh, really builds the prestige of technical education for those uh, who want to do it who prefer to do that rather than a, a an apprenticeship um, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. But it could be potentially very, they could be, if they work, potentially very exciting. Um, Sally, let me bring you in on this now, just from your perspective here in that. Can I say two things? One is about university technical colleges, actually, um, because we run four of them, and that's exactly what they do. You do an academic along with, in, in our cases, engineering and IT. And in the sixth form, uh, in Reading, we have Peter Brett, which is an engineering company that does his apprenticeships through the University Technical College. So we do have schools in this country where academic 
and vocational are done side by side and we are oversubscribed in that school and it means you have to leave your secondary school at 13 to go there at 14. I know they're not universally successful but where they have been they are very successful and certainly all of the curriculum as is done in most colleges is co-created with the employers. So I think there's some examples where it, it does work and schools are doing apprenticeships. Um, I think T levels, we are in the pilot for T levels and we're doing a lot of work. I think the only one slight concern I have about T levels is the speed at which we update our qualification system. So I think at the moment, if you take uh, a digital, uh, it's being worked on for now and it will be stunning. What happens in two years when we've been running T-levels for two years? How quickly do we update our qualifications? And we don't. And we had one stage with the construction industry where the qualification was behind what industry wanted. And because our qualifications, if you like, particularly for 16 to 19, are in a very rigid system it takes a long time to update them so i think at the moment t levels are spot on but unless we have a much more flexible updating of our qualification system my concern is they'll become outdated and then everybody will complain about them so yeah. it's the speed at which businesses change and we need to change our qualifications accordingly yeah and of course we're talking about this in the backdrop of the you know a pandemic when pretty much our landscape has changed on so many levels and quite a few people have made the point of isn't it going to be even harder to get work experience yeah. now if we've got all these rules for obviously social distancing and and everything around that i mean andrew what are your thoughts on that well we, look we can take we can take a glass half empty or glass half full approach the half empty in our businesses we've had um, a shocking 70% reduction in, 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 in demand and output. And that's aerospace, and that's no one person or one company's fault. It, it's reality, and we have to deal with it. And the Sutton Trust uh, recent research reported that up to 40% of apprentices have been interrupted through COVID-19, and up to two-thirds are down on September starts. Now, my perspective is that I'm looking at how not only we survive as a business, but we thrive the other side. We're going to be there the other side, so it's our choice as to what we do in the interim. And I think apprentices have a unique role to play here. So we have suffered enormous redundancies in our business. Very painful thing to do, but we have protected every single one of our apprentices. That's not charity, it's in light and self-interest. They are our lifeblood, they are our future managers and leaders. And uniquely, they've got one extra thing, and that is they're digital natives. And we will still be making gas turbine blades the other side of COVID-19 and in 10 years' time. In fact, we'll probably be on the same programmes in some instances. But if we're making them the same way, we will not be competitive globally. So we need to be using data, we need to be using the fourth industrial revolution to springboard our economy forward. And our apprentices, digital natives, have the opportunity to re really drive our smaller companies through that digital journey. And I think that the smart money is on those smaller companies who recognize that, not only protect their apprenticeships, but capitalize on it for the recovery. Yeah, I'm really conscious of time. We're just coming up to nearly the end uh, of this session and I'm aware there are so many questions. Uh, thank you for all of the comment. Uh, it's really worth looking at the chat if you haven't, just to see what everyone's kind of saying on all of this as well is watching. Um, I, I just want to ask as well, is it the, uh, and just point out, the, a great point that's been made here is, you know, we're talking about lots of schools being rubbish at careers advice and work experience. There are also lots that are doing really good stuff off their own back. And that point's been made a couple of times, you know, um, it's something Ollie and I have talked about as well. Uh, you know, we I've done lots of work with schools who off their own back are doing all of these fantastic projects, particularly in you know, deprived areas, trying to get uh, kids out to get experience. And we shouldn't forget that. But I suppose the point is, is there not being that that's you know it's it, not everyone's doing that and they're not being really recognized for it are they like you know that i personally think that should be part of ofsted you know your rating should be just as much about what you're doing to add value to a kid's life as get them a gcse and maths and english quick point to you robert before i wrap up and i want to ask everyone a question who's watching as well is uh, just obviously there's this uh, leaked report out today about the narrowing 
of the curriculum post uh, COVID and everyone going back to school. What's happening there? This idea that things, you know, it's, there's going to be more of a focus on maths and English and, and things are going to narrow because that doesn't really work with everything we're saying. Well, I think that's uh, uh, that's a sixty million dollar question. What's going to happen to the curriculum? I think part of it is because of the constraints on the timetable and the loss of learning that children have had over the past. Because by September they'll have lost forty percent of the school uh, year, and I I I think that a lot of it is down to the practical, what is possible to be be taught. But it's absolutely vital that. Um, uh, in my view, that we don't lose uh, the uh, the subjects that that students and pupils need to study, which are some of the things we've been talking about um, in terms of skills, vocational studies, and that that is not crowded out because of the coronavirus. How to square that circle is going to be a difficult one because yeah. maths and English is also, and this is where I come down on the knowledge side of things that are the argument that maths and English is essentially how essential maths and English is for someone's livelihood. Yeah, um, well, uh, thank you so much to everyone. I want to ask everyone uh, watching a quick polling question, if I can. So uh, it's popped up here. How confident are you that an apprenticeship guarantee can be delivered? Uh, your options there, extremely confident, quite confident, somewhat confident, little confident, not confident at all. So if you just uh, click on that and then submit it, and uh, that should have popped up on your screen and we'll be able to uh, find out the result of that. Ollie, is that going to pop up and give us the result or is that just something you're collecting no, we'll, in the we'll background? We'll do it. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll uh, gather that in and uh, right. make sure we kind of share that with participants uh, after yeah. this along with the recording. Yeah. And, and again, thank you so much to everyone who's uh, given comments. I know there's still loads of questions uh, to be answered around, you know, funding and everything else. and and. and we will try uh, maybe do another event like this again <laughs> if we can uh, but thank you very much thanks Robert for your time thank you Andrew, Alice, Sally and Ollie as well particularly Ollie for putting all of this together uh, Susan as well behind the scenes who's made all of this happen and to you guys uh, for watching wherever you are uh, if you're anything like me I'm spending a lot of time shielding from the fridge but I'm going to take this moment to go back to the fridge because we all <laughs> deserve a bit of a snack and a break thank you very much uh, take care everyone and uh, yeah, good luck with everything you're doing and stay safe.